Welcome back to the middle of culture. I am one of your co-hosts, Peter. And I'm your other host, Eden. Eden, how have you been? I'm sleepy. I'm an eepy <laughs> boy. I'm an eepy, eepy kid. I hear you. I get that. Yeah. You know, that's this is life. This is this is adulthood. And you know what? I think that maybe that is the biggest, not the biggest, a large indictment on modern society that all of us are all tired basically all the time. It's true. That's true. We have we failed as a society in the way that we are organizing ourselves as a community if all of us are tired all the time. Yeah. Anyway, how you doing? Uh, the same. I mentioned briefly before we started recording, but it has been a, a very busy week with work, including some annoying aspects of just the nature of the kind of doctor I am and the, where we are and everything. It just means that lately I have had, uh, I have had the opportunity to take care of a number of other Idaho urologists, patients, because it's a holiday weekend and they don't think they should have to cover for their patients. And so I am taking care of those people for them. And that oh, is man. awesome. That's some bullshit too. <laughs> I am not going to disagree with you, but it's, I guess, the nature of the job. And so, you know, um, they're, they're nice people who needed to be taken care of. I don't begrudge them that at all. I just find it highly annoying that my hospital says, no, we need to have urology coverage 24, seven, 365 and other, um, hospitals that are of the same size and in the same category as us with as many or more urologists on staff think that they can just say fuck it and not have somebody take call because they know that we will. It's pretty cruel. You know, it's just, I guess, the way it is. But uh, other than that, uh, what you been into lately? Anything good you want to uh, talk about on the pod before we get to our our topic of the day, which, you know, who knows, maybe it'll be a shorter one, but it seems like every time we say that, they go just as long. So <laughs> so what yeah. have you been, what you've been checking out lately? Anything, anything worth mentioning? I do have a few things worth mentioning. Um, so I have been reading a lot the last little bit, okay. um, because I, uh, so there was, there's this series I've been meaning to read for a while called bloom into you, but the first two or three volumes are kind of out of print, hard to get your hands on. Um, but I found like a lot on eBay and it was all eight volumes of the comic, the two anthologies and the three light novels for like 120 bucks, okay. which is like basically list price. And all like, right. that's not bad. I've, I've usually seen this similar type of set, these 13 books for more like 200 to 250. So I was like, okay, we'll see, put this on the watch list. And then it got closer and closer and closer and nobody was bidding on it. And nobody was bidding on it. And 12 hours before it ended, I was like, oh, I feel comfortable maxing out at, 150 and so i put it in and then it did you know the minimum bid as the bid and then nothing until i just won it for the minimum bid and i was like nice. you gotta be kidding me so that showed up um last week and that means that i read uh 10 volumes of comics in like a day and a half because it was very good and really good series um and it, I had a very good time. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's normal romance comic stuff. Um, but I just felt like the characters were really likable and their interactions were really believable. And I just had a blast reading it. Um, and then I followed it up by reading th all three volumes of the comic Run Away With Me Girl, which is a similar sort of romance premise. But, like, the premise of that one is... These two girls were like in a relationship as they were in high school. And then on a high school graduation, one of them said, well, now we have now now we break up, right? Like this isn't going to last. Like I need we both got to go get married to men. Like that's the way this works. This was just some like fun times in high school. Um, and then they run into each other 10 years later 
one of them has been hung up on her. The one who did, got dumped has basically just been in a, you know, a romantic state of suspended animation because this is the one person she's ever really loved or cared about that way. And the other woman is pregnant and engaged to be married in a shotgun wedding. Mm. And that is when they re-encounter each other and uh, complications ensue, is what I will say. <laughs> um, and it was beautiful. It's really gorgeous. The artist, uh, Baton, who does the, uh, who did the manga is just incredible. Just like draws bodies in these really like fluid and like with a lot of motion to them and and it just really feels really malleable almost the art does it's really impressive it was it was beautiful too i i was very very uh surprised by how much i liked it um oh i also finished the second book in the mickey knight series um it was called Deaths of Jocasta, and uh, it was also really good, just like that first one. I think this – what if this whole series is good? What if there's 13 books of just really good neo-noir? Wow. it's a lot of books. That'd be pretty great. I got the third one. I haven't read it yet because I've been reading all this other stuff. But uh, and, and I got a couple other things on my TBR pile before I get to, the, uh, get to that third one. But I'm excited to get to it uh, because those first two are really, really good. Um. A game worth mentioning that I've been playing. Um, have you heard or seen anything about Wuthering Waves, Peter? No, I have not. Well, it is a game that is, it's made by Kuro Games, which is a Hong Kong studio. And if I had to describe this game in a phrase, it would be, hey, uh, Hoyo sure makes a lot of money from Genshin and Honkai we should make one of those. And so that's all it is. It is the most direct blatant ripoff of a video game I've ever played in my life. Okay. And it is, it is the open world exploration of Genshin impact with the combo swapping between characters of Honkai impact third. Uh, and it's not very good, but I have been playing it the last three days quite a bit, so it must not be that bad. Hmm. Um, but it's also, you can also tell that this this bun was not ready to come out of the oven. This game <laughs> came out real hot. Literally every time I close it, it applies at least a hot fix, if not a complete update. Every time I close the program. And so this is multiple times a day they're pushing out hot fixes. So like I imagine it is hell on earth to work at that studio right now because this game was not ready to come out and it came out anyway because Genshin Impact's like third anniversary or fourth anniversary is coming up in the next month or two. And I think they wanted to like get out before that happens. And if the choices were May or August, they should have picked August, maybe, because this game is real janky. For the first two days, whenever you would enter a cutscene, it would not load in the right uh, the right graphics. It would load the long distance graphics, so everything looked like a potato PS1 game, except for your character, who would look like a modern video game character. And then as soon as you would leave the cutscene, that was when slowly over the course of like 10 seconds, the regular, uh, the regular uh, textures would load in. It was so bad. Hmm. It's real. It's, and, it was, it's a real rough launch. And what are you playing it on? Here. Are you playing it on your PC or I'm playing it on my, it's on PC and phone. I gotcha. can, and it, it makes my PC heat up quite a bit. I can imagine if you installed this on a phone, uh, you now have a uh, hand warming device that will burn your fingertips because <laughs> it is really quite intensive on my PC for also being a phone game. Uh, but I'm playing it and like they can you can tell that they're like mm, we weren't quite ready for this here's here's some stuff to say thank you for playing our game sure. like yesterday <laughs> yesterday they just gave you a voucher that's like pick one of the five star characters you can have them for free we're sorry <laughs> uh so that was nice i got a really good healer i got the best healer in the game for free for nothing well, that's, that's um didn't have to like them. even try because again this is this is like the genshin or honkai game so it's like 
it's a gotcha it's a gotcha pun game so you gotta like do your wishes and try to get characters no they just were like here just take one please don't please don't review bomb us so you know we'll see I'm having an okay time. The combat itself, when when it's working, it's working really well. The combat animations and the like, the feel of the combat, it has a parry in it, which is not a thing that Genshin has, or Honkai for that matter. Um, and so it's got a really cool parry. It's got really cool dodging mechanics. Um, the like combos that you do as you hit multiple times are really flashy. Like The animation of the fights is very cool looking. So I keep kind of going back to it, but I don't know if I like it enough that I'm going to, you know, turn this into a game that I log in and do my dailies every day like I do Genshin and Honkai. Sure. So we'll see. And then the last thing I have to mention, um, I, I'll keep it extremely oblique because it came out on Friday. Uh, my wife and I went to see Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. And what did you think about it? Um, Without, you know getting too into it obviously because it's brand new sure the more i think about it and the first we saw it thursday night in a preview showing the more time uh passes from when i saw it last the less i like it oh okay um i think it's got a lot of pacing issues um i think it suffers from the problem that basically every prequel suffers from of why do I care? Because I know where this ends because mm-hmm. I know where the characters are at the start of the next movie. Um, and I, there are ways you can avoid that. And, you know, if, and when you ever see it, we can talk about some prognostication, some, some theories that Cassie and I had about like how you could have made this maybe a little more interesting while still doing a prequel, but it's a very straightforward prequel. Um, the action scenes are very impressive. But here is the biggest problem. During the final, during the credits, they showed a bunch of the best scenes from Fury Road as like a, you just saw Furiosa's backstory. Here's a reminder of what happens in the movie. This is a prequel to. Mm -hmm. And that was the worst possible decision they could have made. Because as I was sitting there thinking, that was fine. Anya Taylor Joy wasn't very good. She should have had the guts to shave her head instead of sissing out and wearing a bald cap. That was weak. <laughs> um, that was that's a, a big complaint I had. Shave your head when you get the role that has to come with a buzzed head. You buzz your head. Charlize did it in Fury Road. You yeah. should have had the guts to do it, Anya Taylor Joy. Um, but she's like a baroness or some bullshit. Like fuck her. Um, anyway. Uh, You can't show me clips of an infinitely, supremely better film after I'm watching the end of your other film. Because, and I'm just like, well, I resent you for making me watch this bad, not as good movie when I could have just been watching Fury Road again, which is maybe the greatest action movie ever made in in the West. Wow. That's some, some high praise. Have you still haven't seen it? You said before we hopped on the call. Nope. Here's, Here's the thing. It's really good. That's what I've heard. <laughs> it lives up to the hype. It absolutely lives up to the hype um, in a way that most movies that are hyped like that don't. Um, but, you know, we saw it again pretty recently. We saw it on a big screen. A friend for her birthday, uh, like, did a private screening at our local art house theater. Um, and so, you know, it's it's pretty fresh in my mind because it's been probably, you know, six or seven months since I'd seen it and on a big screen. And it held up. Even nine years after the fact, that's a ding dang good movie. And this new one, it ain't that good. It's fine. It ain't that good. Yeah. But anyway, what you been up to? Um, not much. As we sort of discussed, uh, off offline, uh, beginning and again, as I kind of hinted at, work has been incredibly busy. Uh, I really have not had much time. I. Gosh, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I've read. I don't think so. I mean, again, chipping away at a few non-books book, that are not exactly the kind of thing we would talk about here. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I have been putting a little more time into Cyberpunk 2077, but basically only on the weekends. Um, that's a good game. 
That's a good game. I it's a think real good I'm game. really glad that I waited to play it um, as long as I did because, you know, I, I'm playing it in that polished state where um, it seems that pretty universally everybody's like, okay, not only did they fix it, but they made it like a, a fantastic game. And so I'm having a good time with that. Um, yeah, I, I will say as a person who played earlier and then replayed it after the 2.0 drop happened and Phantom Liberty came out, it was a good game before, but man, they really figured out a far better leveling system and like a far more satisfying progression system for you as a character. Um, and it's, it's really polished at this point. Yeah. So I have been enjoying that in the bits that I've been able to play it. Uh, I did jump back in a little bit to Hades and did order or rather buy Hades too. Uh, and and did one or two runs of that. Um, if you nice. like Hades, Hades 2 is more of that, but doesn't feel like a complete retread. And so I think that once that game is done, it's going to be another really stellar game, which going back and playing some more Hades, I was reminded just how well they, they really just dialed that game in. Um, it, it's a It's a really good game and one that, if anybody hasn't played it, absolutely sure get Hades too. But uh, I don't think you would. Uh, I don't think you'd feel bad if you spent some money on Hades, uh, the first game as well, and played it also. Um, other than that, that's about it. Other than a couple new albums uh, worth mentioning that have come out in the last few weeks. Uh, the first one that I would mention is uh, the album Shaman from the band Helion. I think it's supposed to be Helion. I think the way they write it is stylized. At least that's what I had heard. Uh, the name, if you were to search for them, it is Hell Colon On. Uh, they are a Ukrainian death metal band. And I think Shaman might be one of the best death metal albums I've heard in a while. Uh, it is really, really good. And then the new album, Mind Burns Alive, from the uh, Arkansas band Paul Bearer. Uh, they're kind of... Paul Bearer and Chemis came out around the same time as each other. Um, I think Paul Bearer's first album was 2014, Chemis was 2015. Uh, and they were both not really that similar to each other in sound, but in terms of kind of reinvigorating sort of an American take on doom metal. Uh, they were, they were kind of pioneers in the last, you know, decade or so. Um, Paul bear, I always liked chemists more chemists had a little more crunch to their guitars, a little more punch to their sound that I think just kind of stuck with me. And, um, this latest Paul bear album is in many ways, probably the least metal, of all of Paul Bearer's stuff sonically, but thematically it's a very heavy album. Uh, it's very contemplative. It's very a kind of emotional. Uh, the songs have a very cathartic feel to them. And I don't know if that's what it is about it. I haven't really been able to pin down, but something about this album has really clicked with me. And I've been listening to a lot of the, of those two albums in the last couple of weeks very different feels, you know, Paul Bearer, it's all clean singing. Oh, yeah. It's pretty mellow. Uh, Helion is all, I mean, it is death metal, but they do incorporate That's some kind of different, you know, the thing I like about Helion is that their albums really do incorporate uh, some sounds. And, and again, some of those little motifs that you'll sometimes hear in not completely Western music. It's not exactly that kind of, you know, you get somewhere it pulls in a lot of Middle Eastern vibes, but this kind of brings in that you listen to it and you go, okay, yeah, I, I, yes, I can understand that these are like Eastern European, not Western European. Uh, yeah. and so, uh, they're, they're both really good albums and I have been listening to them a lot. Has Paul Bear always done only clean vocals? Yes. For the most part. Chemist. I feel like, I feel like I've listened to of them. the two. But yeah. Paul Bear has pretty much, I mean, there's a few moments where it's not really harsh vocals where it's like, especially on like on this album, there'll be moments where 
underneath the clean vocal, you can hear a really, really faint, again, not like an actual growl, but but a more, uh, there's a little more vocal fry to the voice. Um, but yeah, Paul Bear is, is, is pretty much exclusively clean vocals. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I have listened to them before, but if I have, it's been a while. Anyway, I have to check it out. Sounds good. Yeah, I have been enjoying those two, but uh, that's about it. So um, why don't we jump into our topic for the week, which is going to be a little, a little freewheeling, a little, uh, I, you know, we were trying to come up with ideas and I knew looking ahead that my week of work was going to be brutal. Uh, I didn't really realize how brutal it was going to be. It, let's just say this last week exceeded my expectations. But <laughs> I kind of threw out an idea uh, to Eden about coming back and talking about music. And, and I'll be honest, listeners, sometimes that's easy for me because I tend to have music playing almost all the time. And so it's a, a fairly easy thing for me to talk about uh, quickly without having to do too much preparation. But sure. I initially threw that out and then kind of shortly after I had sent you a message, I was like, actually, maybe let's talk about some live music experiences. So I don't yeah. have like a specific, here's what we've got to do. But, you know, I mean, I kind of made a list of things like what was some, you know, maybe what was our first show, our best show, most disappointing, surprising, recent, just kind of what are some of our, some of the live music events we have seen over the years uh, that stand out that we thought were worth talking about. And I'll kick it off with my first show. And that Go was Rush. And it was the Roll the Bones tour. Uh, probably by the time they made it to Salt Lake, I would say it was 1992. Uh, I believe Roll the Bones came out in 91, but I think it was kind of spring of 92 before Rush made it to Utah. And that that was my first a real concert, you know, I mean, I'd been to other musical performances, but they don't really count, but certainly my first rock concert, uh, it was Rush for the Roll the Bones tour. Uh, Mr. Big opened for them. Uh, Mr. Big was well known for their single, I'm the one who wants to be with you or be with you or whatever the hell that stupid song is called, because it kind of sucks. And then I went and saw them live and I'm like, wait a second, Mr. Big is one of those anomalies. Because you've got Billy Sheehan on bass, who is an incredible bass player. And you've got Paul Gilbert on lead guitar, who's, again, an incredible guitarist. And the song they got known for is like the most just triacly, you know, saccharine, schmaltzy power ballad that's barely even rock because it was more acoustic. And, and it, was, it was an interesting... Um, eye opener to Mr. Big. <laughs> but uh, then Rush came out and Rush played and Rush was amazing. And we've talked about Rush a number of times on the podcast, but I would just tell folks there's a whole lot of live Rush performances available on YouTube. And if you've never watched or seen Rush live, you owe it to yourself to go and watch this band. They are a three piece band and uh, they do a fantastic job live of really creating a huge, huge sound, much bigger than what you really think should be possible by a three-piece band live. Now, of course, you could accomplish all that with a number of backing tracks and crap like that, but Rush, they're professionals. They cared. They weren't going to do that. What they were going to do is they were going to have effects pedals and sample pedals and these things that yes, there were some pre-recorded parts occasionally, but they were triggering these live while they're playing and while they're maybe singing. And you know, you've seen Rush, but it was always incredible where Getty Lee, the bassist and the lead guitarist or the lead vocalist would be up there and he's singing and he's playing bass pedals with his feet while maybe playing the keyboards with his hands all at the same time, because that's just how phenomenally talented these three musicians were. And uh, it was at the Delta Center, which was a terrible venue to see. Uh, the, acu the acoustics were hot garbage, but it was my first rock show. I was 15. 
I got a ticket with my best friend at the time. He came with me and it was just two 15 year olds in the Delta center at this rock show. And it was absolutely incredible. It was so exciting. It was not the best rush show I've ever been to. I've seen them at better venues and better shows. And, uh, but you know, this was, this was an extremely exciting first concert for me. Okay. So what's your favorite rush concert then? Um, I think my favorite Rush concert probably was when you and I saw them in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina on July 4th, 2002, because this was after, so again, real short Rush history for people who may not know, Uh, Rush was pretty regular in putting out albums until 1996, and then there were a handful, there were really two tragedies in in Neil Peart's, the drummer, his life, where he lost both a wife and a daughter in a fairly short uh, period of time. And so Rush kind of went on hiatus, and it was a little uncertain what the future of the band was because they'd been together for enough years that... You know, Getty and Alex had both kind of said, no, there's no rush if it's not all three of us. And we're going to all, all three of us need to be on board if it's going to be a rush. And so then they released after quite a few years, they came back with their album, um, Vapor Trails, which right from the get go starts off with just a statement that here's Rush, they're back. And, and so having had a, a long gap in there, because I saw Rush in 92 for the Roll the Bones tour. And then on the Counterparts tour, something happened and they never ended up coming to Utah. And then on the Test for Echo tour, they came to Utah while I was in Guatemala. So I didn't get to see them. So it had been 10 years since I'd seen Rush live. And so getting to see them at that outdoor a, you know, that outdoor venue there in Raleigh and it was the 4th of July. And so there was a whole big fireworks show at the end. That was an awesome show. That's definitely my favorite show. And I saw them in Charlotte and Raleigh and I've seen them in Boston and I've seen them in, you know, in Utah again at, at USANA. Uh, but no, that one there in Raleigh on the 4th in 2002 for the Vapor Trails tour, that was definitely the best show. Well, that was also my first show. So there you double go. dipping, dear listeners. That was my <laughs> first show. It was cool. It was really great. I've only ever seen Rush outside, I come to realize, because that was an amphitheater. And then I saw them twice at USANA. Um, and that's the only places I've ever seen them was outside. So thank goodness I never had to deal with the terrible acoustics of the <laughs> Delta Center. Oh, because so that is a so basketball arena. And it is good for basketball and it is shit for everything else. <laughs> that is very true. Very true. But yeah, well, what was so your... that was my first, that was, was my it... first concert. It was oh, great. that was your first it... concert. I didn't realize it was yeah. just your first. Ru- oh, wow. Okay. It's the first one I can think of that was not like uh, classical music. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Because I was less interesting than you, I guess. I did not try. That's not true. That's not true. I thought of an earlier one. My first concert was when I lied to our parents <laughs> and told them I was going to someone else's house. And then we all piled into a car and went to the big ass show at, in down, well, at the Salt Lake Fairgrounds in Salt Lake City, Utah. And that is where I saw, this is so wild to now be thinking about. Cause I was like, I guess my first show was that restaurant. No dog. It was the big ass show where I saw Primus play ah, live. Yes. And that was my first concert. I was really excited to see orgy and Primus and orgy did not put on a good live show. They sound like shit live. Like maybe they didn't after 1996 or 1997, whenever the hell this was. Sure. But I think it was 97 because Primus was touring for the Brown album, which was in 96 or 97. Um, But at any rate, I was really excited to see Orgy. They sucked. I was really excited to see Primus. You know who puts on a good show? Oh, even I bet in a Primus huge does. Huge crowd. Primus puts on a hell of a show. Les Claypool is as weird as you would think he would be. 
uh when he is live as he is on the records and that was my very first concert was sneaking out if i don't think mom and dad listen to the podcast but if you do ha 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 i snuck out when i was 15 and went to the big ass show ha ha ha, 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 ha. <laughs> um yeah it was great nice it was, a, it was an incredible experience uh i did i meant to go to other big ass shows um but for some reason i never did it was the only one i ever made it to um which is kind of a shame but uh, uh, yeah. then the second one I can think of is that uh, that Vapor Trails tour when I was like 18. Yeah. And and to put this into perspective really quick for few, for folks, I actually moved to North Carolina for medical school three weeks early, specifically yeah. for this show, because they were so play- we could make it out there. Yep, yeah, I remember they this. were playing in Raleigh, North Carolina on the 4th of July Medical school started for me the end of July. They were playing in Utah in the mid to end of August. So it was like, I can't see them in August. The only way I can see them is we go to North Carolina a couple weeks earlier and move in the beginning of July instead of kind of middle of July so that we so that I could go to that show because again this was a big deal i mean this was this was us not knowing at a time for a couple of years nobody knew if rush was ever going to tour again or put out another yeah. album and so this was like no i will see them at this show and and so yeah that was that was a fun show and i was really glad you came out to help us move and so I was really glad that uh, you and I could go to that concert together. Yeah, it was a blast. That was a very fun show. Yeah, it was. So, you know, have you ever been to a concert where, I mean, you already kind of mentioned the orgy was, sounds like they were pretty disappointing. Any oh, other show that you've been to where you were just like, wow, this is live. This is, this is not great. I don't know that there was anyone that was really that disappointing that I was necessarily there to see one of the, one of the uh, salient memories for me of going to a show is I went to an RX bandits show and you might be asking yourself, Eden, why would the fuck would you go to the RX bandits? Because those guys suck. I'll tell you why it's because the Melvins were opening for them. This was th- why why would the Melvins be opening for anyone? Because they're the Melvins. They should That's be true. the headliner. I and, mean, I don't even know who why? RX Bandits are, but I know who the Melvins are. Well, you're not missing out anything by not knowing who RX Bandits are. But yeah, they were it, it was actually and come to think of it, it was two bands opening for the RX Bandits, both of which I was actually there to see. This was such a weird show. It was Dredge okay. the Melvins. And the RX Bandits. And guess what? I left one song into the RX Bandits set because I was like, this sucks. Because <laughs> I had seen what I was there to see, which was Dredge and then the Melvins. Yeah. And that was fun. That was a cool. And here's the thing. I would have loved both of those to be the headliner because I would have gotten a lot more music out of them. Because sure. both of them played for like 30, 40 minutes. Right. Um, but they both put on great shows. They were great opening bands. And then the RX Bandit started. I listened to the first song and I was like, I'm good. Bye. Interesting. So I would say probably the time I was most disappointed in a concert was... Iron Maiden. Really? I've really. never seen Maiden live. So um, here's what I'll tell you. Maiden's dead at this point. So Bruce Dickinson is an incredible showman. He's all over the stage. He's moving. You got the three guitarists. You, I mean, you got Steve Harris up there. It's Iron Maiden. But here was the problem. Iron Maiden was good, but it was at USANA. But, okay. Ghost opened. Now, I'm not a big Ghost fan. I think their whole shtick has worn a little thin for me personally. They've got a few good songs, but Ghost sounded incredible. And a lot of their songs hit hard live, so much more so than they do on the album. 
And then Maiden comes out, and I remember turning to Jess, my oldest, who was there with me, and John Hegstead, a friend of mine who goes to a lot of concerts, and we kind of looked at each other and we're like, what happened? The sound was so dog shit for Iron Maiden. The vocals had this bizarre echo to them. Everything sounded muddy and just garbagey. Like it was like, it was like Maiden was playing underwater. And it's That's like, weird. I know this isn't the venue because Ghost sounded incredible as the opener. But then whenever they switched over for whoever was in charge of doing Maiden sound, it just was terrible. And so it was exciting to see Iron Maiden live because Iron Maiden is Iron Maiden for hell's sake. But it sounded so, so bad that it just wasn't very fun because we could barely hear. We could, couldn't could understand any of the lyrics. You only knew them because they're Maiden songs that you knew. And, and so it was, I mean, it was a huge, huge bummer because, because it didn't have to be that way because Go sounded amazing at the start. So that was definitely bummer. the one that I was like, this sucks. Yeah. Well, how did you, how do you blow it like that guys? Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was really disappointing. So what would you say if you had to really pin it down to your favorite show the fate you're like when you think back on concerts you're like this is the one that hmm. just like like sticks out in my mind hmm uh, in terms of experience i don't know that it's like this is a band i have to be in a very specific mood to listen to okay but in terms of just the experience of being in the show it would have to be when i saw sun O. Oh, or yeah. Sun, or however you want to, I'll call him Sun-O <laughs> because I know that they just call themselves Sun, and I'm like, you put an O at the end of your name, you're going to be called Sun-O, deal with it. Exactly. Uh, th those guys. I saw them at a very small venue in downtown Salt Lake, and it was the loudest concert <laughs> I've ever been to in my life. I I'm probably sure. still have... I probably still have uh, damage to my ears from that concert. Incredible experience. One of the greatest concerts I've ever been to in my pee pick in life. Um, because the thing about Suno, in case you don't know listeners, is that they do a lot of just like drone, like they are the quintessential drone metal band because they will just hold a note for four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and and you've got to understand, listeners, these are like notes that are low enough and just, just loud enough that if the brown note exists, Sun-O is going to be it. the band that's going to really discover it. <laughs> Absolutely. It is brown note adjacent for like 15 minutes straight. It was in incredible i still think about that concert sometimes and i'm like god my whole body just shook oh yeah like for an hour it was have you ever seen them i have not i remember you oh, telling man. me about it though and and being familiar with their music and and imagining what it would be like live i you know i don't know if my uh i, I may be too old my my bowel and bladder functions may not stand up as i approach my 50s <laughs> I, d I don't know if I could do it today, but when I was like 23, that was the coolest shit I had ever experienced <laughs> in my life. I bet. How about I you? Bet. What would you say is the coolest concert or the best concert you've ever been to? Uh, so, you know, it's a tough one. I, I will say the concert that most impressed me that I came away going, that is the best live band I've ever seen was Lamb of God at the uh, Ford Center, outdoor part of the Ford Center in Boise on the Slayer Farewell Tour. So the Slayer okay. Farewell Tour, guys, it was Napalm Death first, then it was Testament, then it was Anthrax, then it was Lamb of God, and then finally Jesus. at like 1130, it was Slayer. I will say it's an interesting show because it's simultaneously – the best, like, again, when Lamb of God was done, my friend John and I, we turned to each other and we were like, oh my, we have to go see Lamb of God play live whenever, wherever. It was that good. 
But there is a comedian, and I can't remember his name, and I remember when I thought about this a week ago, I was going to try and find the clip. But there's a comedian who's kind of a metalhead, and he has this bit where he talks about going to see Slayer in concert. And he's talking mm-hmm. about going with his wife, and he's like, "Get Slayer's getting ready to come out, and he's just like, the Slayer fans are like, Slayer! And he's like, what? Is-? It's a really funny bit. It's accurate. It was so weird because it's the same people. We've all been here for like four hours and we've been just rocking hard to these bands and the mosh pit's been going nuts and my friend was getting grinded on and I was his gay husband for 30 seconds so that this girl would stop grinding on him. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. He you holds do what up you and gotta he, do. he points to his wedding ring and she still is looking mad when he'd like pushed her away. And then he points to me and all of a sudden she's so apologetic. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And so I'm like, yep. <laughs> Anytime I'm there for you, 100%. That's good. That's the kind of wingman I am. And then... That's that's true friendship. And then Slayer comes out, and there's big black curtains in front, and there's all these skulls and upside-down crosses and pentagrams floating around. And, you know, if you've listened to the song Raining Blood by Slayer, you know it starts with bizarre noises, and so it's like those kinds of noises where it's like they almost sound like human wails and... And like screams and all this stuff is going on and it's just black and it's 1130 and we've all been here for hours and people are shit faced at this time. And dude, when the Slayer part of the concert started, I was like, I'm a big guy. I'm like six, two, six, three, like 280 pounds. I, I'm, I could stand to lose some fat, but I got a lot of muscle on me too. And I'm like, I'm backing up. I'm getting away from the mosh pit because this is scaring me a little bit. So fair. yeah, it was a wild show, but lamb of God, they were so good live. Randy Blythe, the lead vocalist for lamb of God has, in my opinion, the most intelligible growl of anyone in metal. Like a lot of times harsh vocalists, they'll growl and you can't really understand what they're saying unless you know But even people who aren't familiar with like Lamb of God's music or with really harsh vocals, you throw on Lamb of God and they can understand, like you can understand him. So we're all just mosh and they do like so many of their songs, you can tell they wrote them for the live performance because at least 50% of their songs just have incredible breakdowns where the mosh pit is going to lose its mind. And so just, oh, they were so incredibly good live and the energy and yeah, Lamb of God live was probably the best show I've ever been to. They were amazing. That's pretty cool. I that, that sounds like a hell of a concert, a lot of concert, maybe too much concert for me. It, well, so in this is even because we had to drive from Pocatello over to Boise, which is like a three, three and a half hour drive, depending on, on oh boy. how traffic is. We actually completely missed Napalm Death. And even then, mm. so we were only there for Testament, Anthrax, Lamb of God and Slayer. Even then, like, boy, by the time Slayer got out, I was like, I would have been great just to see those three. Also, I'm a bigger fan of all three of those bands than I am Slayer because I don't really like – like Slayer has some great songs, but I don't really love Slayer that much. Um, Yeah. So it was was almost – no, it wasn't almost. It was definitely too much. But um, but yeah, Lamb of God just – they killed – I mean, Testament's great. They, there was an amazing part where this little kid, he looks like he's maybe eight or nine. He's sitting on his dad's shoulders, big set of, you know, like construction noise, noise protecting headphones on this kid. But like Chuck Billy, the lead vocalist with the dad's permission, they get that kid up on stage and he's standing up on stage with, uh, with all the Testament and the guitarists are coming over and handed him picks. And this kid's chucking picks out into the stage. And then he's like throwing up horns and, He's up on stage just like jamming out with the band for like five minutes. It was so much fun. Every time he'd nice. toss out a pick, the crowd just lost their minds. I mean, this is like core memory for this kid. He, 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 oh, he for loved sure. It. And um, so, again, Testament, I love Testament. I've seen them live a bunch. They're very, very good live. Uh, I've seen Anthrax a couple times, but Lamb of God was the one that uh, I had never seen before and was like, oh, yeah, no, these guys were 
it, it was like next level live show. So see the only show besides that, the big ass show, my first concert, which has like three or four stages and like 20 bands over the course of a day. Uh-huh. And that you just like pick a couple that you actually care about. And like, you hope you get an okay, like, place to hear those the only other one that i've been to that's been like a biggish show like that with more than just like an open like one or two openers maybe for a for a single band was when our sister vanessa and i went to see uh specifically the co-headliners were mastodon and death clock the band Ooh. from the tv show metalocalypse yeah um and opening for them were converge and high on fire holy and crap that was and it was at the old Saltaire, um, and it was a hell of a show. That was a wild show, dude. Um, and Converge played first, and like Converge is like real fast gore grind, and it's just like, da, 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 and then the song's over. Um, and then High on Fire went on, and I was like, they're fine. I don't, they're, they're the worst of those four bands, but like they were still pretty okay. And then Mastodon comes out, and they're just killing it because oh, Mastodon yeah. is like an all timer band. They are just really, really solid. Oh yeah. And then it ended with death clock playing and it was really fun because it was one of those things where like, again, listeners, if you don't know, it's an animated TV show called Metalocalypse, and it is about the greatest band of all time who is prophesized to destroy the world and all of the silly hijinks that the band members get up to. But obviously you can't play a band if you are computer or you are just drawn animated characters. So there is an actual band that plays all of the music that is led by the showrunner, who is also the lead writer on the show, the vocalist and lead guitarist for the band, for the, for the fake band that plays the music for the band in the show to play. And so they had the band underneath and then they had a huge screen where they had a whole concert's worth of fake footage of Death Clock playing the music. And well, and it was and also wild. it's worth mentioning. I mean, Gene Hoagland Gene is there Hoagland as the drummer. Is the drummer. Gene Gene Hoagland was there. Hoagland is the drummer. The Atomic Clock himself was right there and doing the damn thing and it was incredible. That show was so much fun. Uh we had oh, it was such a blast and like it was stinky cuz it was out right next to the lake <laughs> and yep. I don't know if Vanessa had ever been that close to the Great Salt Lake before because she was like why does it smell like that and I was like dog that's the lake it always <laughs> smells that's, that's like that that's just what it smells like <laughs> You ask me why back in the olden times they were like, let us build our social hall out on the shores of the Grand Salt Lake. Like, it stinks. So it's no wonder that it has become this run-down, like, concert venue. Yeah. But uh, that was a hell of a show. I'll that bet. was a really good show. I bet. Yeah. Um. So a couple others that I want to mention because they kind of bookended an interesting time. And, uh, that is, uh, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to mention the bands cult of Luna and Yob. Now, two of the bands that are probably in my top five, if not top five, then for sure. Top 10. I mean, you know, when I think about my favorite bands, we've got neurosis, cult of Luna, Yob, fate's warning, uh, the ocean. Um, so I mean, Yob and cult of Luna are right up there, right up there. I saw cult of Luna at the Urban Lounge in Salt Lake City. It is a small little venue. If you have ever listened to Cult of Luna's music, try and imagine that in a small little venue and you will understand being completely and thoroughly overwhelmed. Oh, I mean, man. Couple guitarists, couple drummers. We've got, it was, it was so intense. And it's interesting because Cult of Luna played right after Emma Ruth Rundle who was playing solo, just her and her guitar. So we go from Emma Ruth Rundle, just her and her guitar for half an hour to then like 90 minutes of just, and just this assault on our senses of cult of Luna. That concert was March 7th, 2020. So now listeners just think back to what happened six to seven days later, depending on where you were in 2020. So I saw Cult of Luna, and then everything shut down. 
Jeez, what a last thing to see. Yeah. So Cult of Luna was my last show for over two years. And then in May of 2022, at Soundwell in Salt Lake City, another small venue, Jess, my oldest and I, we went to Yob. And that was my first show after the pandemic that I went to. And again, Yob, while they are just a three-piece, they are also no slouches at creating a grand wall of sound. But if you've ever listened to Yob's music, you'll know that Mike Sheet, the lead vocalist and guitarist, he has this very interesting voice. And he'll do some harsh growls, but when he sings clean, it's often this kind of weirder, little high-pitched And it was just, oh my gosh, it was such an experience because it's just the three of them up there on stage. And Mike kind of is like, like Yob's music. And this is one of those things that I know you'll totally get it, Eden. People who just hear Yob won't get it. But Yob's music, in my opinion, is some of the most spiritual metal I've ever heard in my life. Does that, does that make sense? You know what I mean, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So Mike is up there. Absolutely. And like the only way I, my brain would describe it is it was like, he was the shaman just carrying us all through this psychedelic experience of growth and personal discovery, because that's what Yob's music is like. And it was so incredible to experience that after two years of nothing and to have Yob in this small intimate venue be my first concert back. And I'm experiencing it there with my oldest who they're not a huge fan of metal, but they like it enough that they go to a ton of shows with me. Anytime I'm going down to Salt Lake, I'll be like, Hey Jess, I'm going to a show. Do you want to come? And if they can, they almost always come with me. And it's such a great thing just to do where the two of us will go and just experience this. And I have such a fondness now for the band Yob because I've seen them twice since the pandemic ended. And both times it was these smaller venues. And again, it had that very, that just that intimate. And again, almost a ritualistic feel to it where through the music, we were being taken on this journey of self-discovery. We were having, you know, our, we were coming into, we were discovering ourselves. We were coming into who we were through this musical experience. And, and it oh, was yeah. just incredible. They're so good live. Uh, I hope that someday you can see them. I hear rumors. They say they're working on a new album and that they're going to go on tour again. Uh, but Yob is, again, even for people who aren't huge into metal, there's just something ethereal uh, to the music of Yob that even though it can be so, so heavy, uh, it, it's, it's a, it is again, the only way I can put it is it really is almost like this. It's kind of a spiritual experience. There's this meditative, uh, aspect to their music that translates incredibly well when they're playing live. So that was, those were, That's those were a cool. couple of really cool ones. Um, and then Ooh, I, th- I have yes. to, Ooh, please do. I, as you were talking. I was thinking, and I remembered the worst experience I've ever had at a concert. <laughs> okay, let's it hear it. It was not the RX Bandits being terrible. This was one where I was disappointed in the people who I went to go see. And that is, a few years ago, my wife and I went to go see one of her all-time favorite bands and a band that I liked, I used to like. I don't listen to them really very often anymore because I don't like their newer stuff. The Mountain Goats. Okay. And here's the problem. I, I, you're probably not a Mountain Goats person. I have not heard of them. Um, you've, never, you've never even heard of the I, Mountain Goats? No, I am not familiar. Indie rock darlings. Been around since John Darnielle, who is the lead singer, songwriter, guitarist. Um, for a long time, it was just a single him. It was just a one piece him recording on like reel to reel tapes in his house and then selling cassettes. And that was like through like the late nineties. That's who he was as a person, like going on tours by himself with an acoustic guitar, selling cassette tapes out of the trunk of his car. Um, and that era of, uh, mountain goats, 
incredible. Cassie went and saw them when they were tiny-ish like that when she was out in Utah. They came to Provo or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they eventually became like a full band. He's got a few albums from like probably late 90s to late 20 or 2000s where like they really have hit their stride. You will have heard some of their songs. If you listen to some of their songs, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've heard this. Sure. This has shown up in five indie movies I've seen in the last two decades. Um, but here's the problem. And I say this and you're going to be like, Eden, this is an asshole thing to say, but it is true. <laughs> okay. The problem is his songs were always about the agony of knowing and being known and like just like heartbreaking, heart wrenching lyrics that were really relatable. You know, his most famous song has this line that says, I hope you die. I hope we both die hand in hand drowning like that sort of stuff. <laughs> well, he's like and it's like this acoustic song and there's a guitar playing behind him. It's like a really famous song. When you hear it, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I know. No, I know this song. Here's the problem. He got happy. He met his wife. He got fat and happy, became a dad, and now his music fucking sucks, dog. <laughs> his music is so fucking terrible now because he's a happy person. <laughs> And so, like, now, instead of writing songs about, like, I want to kill myself and I wish that my ex was dead, now he's writing songs like, here's a concept album about professional wrestling. Here's a concept <laughs> album about playing D&D. &D. And I'm like, this fucking sucks, bro. You, your music used to mean something. And, like, I hadn't liked their albums, but I was like, surely, surely if I go to hear them live, they'll play the hits. You got to play the hits when you go live. Sure. And so we go to the show and they're playing the hits. But the zhuzh is not there. The sauce is gone. He doesn't and feel so it left, anymore. We left at intermission, dog. Oh, man. We didn't stay for one of my wife's all-time favorite bands because we looked at each other at intermission. We were like, maybe this band sucks now. And we left. <laughs> Wow, that's too bad. <laughs> so that's the worst concert I've ever been to was probably 2017, 2018, seeing a fat, happy John Darnielle singing songs about D&D &D and professional wrestling. <laughs> well, I remembered another one that was disappointing, um, and, and I'll make this one brief. Uh, it was uh, it was Death Angel and Anthrax. Now, Death Angel's great live. I saw them not too long ago. Maybe it was a couple years now at the Bay Strikes Back Tour. Death Angel, Exodus, Testament, three classic Bay Area thrash bands that started in the 80s and are still together and are so much heavier. I mean, especially all three of them, really. Death Angel, Exodus, and Testament, they never... They never turned into the simps that uh, Metallica and Megadeth turned into. Uh, they oh, they no. stayed heavy always and are so much heavier and better uh, than Metallica is and has been honestly since like the late 80s and early 90s. But Death Angel was great. There were a couple smaller bands that opened that were very impressive. And then Anthrax comes on. Now, this was up in Idaho Falls at a fairly smaller venue. Anthrax comes on. And Anthrax has too much gear and they keep blowing the breakers at the oh, venue. No. And after, oh, no. after blowing the power at the venue three times, they've maybe made it through three songs. They finally were like, we're sorry, guys, we can't keep doing this. And then they stopped the show early. And so that was a real bummer. I uh, got to see them afterwards, like I said, over in Boise at a venue that was ready for them. But yeah, they just, they had too much crap. They'd start playing and they would, they would just, boom, all the power in the venue would go out and they'd have to go and like turn things back on. And, and so they did not finish their set. Uh, they barely even started it. Well, That's I've brutal. got one more big show to talk about, and it is an interesting one in that in some ways it's my favorite. In some ways it is the show that fills me with the most regret in my life. So do you have anything oh, you want to okay. talk about before I wrap up with this? You one? can. Yeah, I was going to say you can close us out on that. I do have three really quick ones I want to mention. I I just went to a lot of shows when I lived in Utah, and now I just don't because like. I was a half hour from Salt Lake back then. Yep. So it was real easy to be like, oh, a band is playing. I'm going to go see them. Nowadays, it's like, oh, a band is playing. 
in Chicago. I guess I better <laughs> drive three and a half hours, find a place to stay, find someone to watch my dogs for the night because I'm going to have to stay out there. So I just don't go to concerts anymore. Yeah. If people come, I try to see them. Although I will admit it still haunts me to this day that I was not able to get tickets for Godspeed You Black Emperor when they were here last mm. November. Yeah. I wanted, I mean, this is one of my top three bands of all time, and they were in my town, but it sold out, and I was not able to go see them, and it will forever haunt me whenever I think about that band. <laughs> uh, but the ones I do want to mention, these were all just shows that I went to at very small venues, very poorly attended in all three cases. And in at least one of those cases, it's sh shocking to think about now, but it was before she went big. Um, and those are, I saw the rapper Soul in a small, small venue in downtown uh, Salt Lake. It was a rapper I'd really gotten into and he was coming. And so I went to this show and there was like 15 other people in this, wow. in this bar. There was like no one, but they put on a show and it was a really good show and I had a blast, but like legitimately there was less than 20 people there to see the band, which was a bummer, but like that's what happens. Slightly larger crowd, 30, maybe 35 people was when I got to see Kylesa live Ooh. in my, in our parents' town of Layton for some reason. Wow. They were playing at this tiny band, like this tiny bar in Layton, Utah um, it was too tiny for double drums, uh -huh. uh, but those guys put on a hell of a show. That was I a bet. really fun concert again for probably 35 or 40 people in the, like in the like concert area. There were other people in the, in the bar, but it was really loud and really, really fun. And then the weirdest one I will close out on is I saw Regina Spector live right before begin to hope came out. And it was just her and her piano that she would drum on the side of with a drumstick to do percussion when she needed percussion. Wow. And that was a really cool show. Like, it's fuck Regina Spector o'clock all the time these days. I think she has a she has proven herself to have abhorrent views in the last five or six years. Uh, but I still have a lot of fondness for her early stuff. Um, and she was touring for her it was her second album uh and and her big album that broke out was begin to hope it was like it has that song on the radio it has the fidelity song that was everywhere again in every uh um indie uh track or indie album indie uh what do you call it, movie for mm -hmm. like six years there um and we saw her right before like two months before it came out. So she played a bunch of her older songs and a few of those new songs that would then come out on Begin to Hope. And that was really cool for it to just be her and a piano and a drumstick. It was a real blast. And uh, cool. again, not a fan of her as a person these days, but uh really, really fun concert. Nice. You know, I too, I mean, Salt Lake is the closest place for me. So it's about two and a half hours, but I've definitely made an effort um, you know, since I finished med school and residency to try and go to more shows, um, I mean, just had some incredible shows down in Salt Lake, uh, Evergrave's great, uh, live love them. Uh, Arch, uh, Arch enemy was pretty good. Amana Marth was a blast live. Didn't know what to expect. Thought people were falling down when all of a sudden I realized, oh no, the 3000 of us sitting in this, in this audience, we're all going to sit down and pretend that we are rowing a Viking longship. And, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Lacuna Coil was so much better live than their albums up to that point would have made me think that they would be. Uh, they okay. were great. Epica was awesome. Um, you know, oh, uh, Tesseract. Tesseract is super cool live. Uh, just some really, really fun. Allegion and Neobliviscaris. Uh, had some, I've seen them a couple times, great shows with them in smaller venues. Uh, but there's this one show that stands out. And again, it you, you'll know when I start talking about why it fills me with regret. But is also probably the one show when I think back, I go, oh man, I am never going to forget this show. And that was back in 2018, 
it was crucial fest at the, um, the, the Salt Lake state fairgrounds and Friday night at crucial fest. It was Russian shirt, Russian circles and Chelsea Wolf. I love Russian circles. Oh, yeah. Um, absolutely incredible. Uh, probably, in fact, I've thought about reaching out to the band and letting them know that my estimate is there are probably more men in the country have been sterilized to Russian circles music than any other music in the world, at least, or rather, at least in America, because I do a lot of vasectomies and Russian circles is my go-to band to play when I'm doing a vasectomy because I love it, but it's also because it's instrumental, nobody's going to get offended. And so I listen to Russian circles almost exclusively when I sterilize men and I do a lot of that. So over the years, I'm sure that again, more babies have been, their conception has been stopped by Russian circles than any other band in America. I think that that's an important that's, thing for them to know. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> but then the final headliner Saturday night And I paid the extra to have VIP tickets. So I literally had my hands on the stage and that was neurosis. Now, why do I have regret about this concert? Eden, do you know? No. Because I sent you pictures of them setting up for neurosis and you were like, holy shit, dude, I would have totally flown out there if I had known they were playing. And I feel bad to this day that I didn't let you know so that you couldn't join me there to see Neurosis because chances are very good Neurosis is No one will ever see Neurosis again, yeah. Correct. It was an interesting show in that there was zero interaction with the crowd. Those who are familiar with Neurosis probably wouldn't be surprised by that at all. It It was just this incredibly intense two hours of like, I don't know, it was probably what? Two hours was probably like nine or 10 songs was all. But yeah. it was so intense. It was the loudest show I've ever been to. I, and I have good head earplugs and stuff, so I didn't suffer any hearing loss from it. But the sound waves were so intense that if you tried to breathe through your nose, you couldn't because the air pressure from the sound waves would collapse your nostrils as you tried to inhale. That's so incredible. you had to breathe through your mouth. And I would look down and I could see my clothes vibrating as if in a wind. There was no <laughs> wind. When a song would be over, the friends and I who were there right up against the stage would step back and lean down and put our hands on our knees and take deep breaths to try and catch our breath. I'm getting alerts from my Apple watch at the time, I think, saying like, you're not moving and your heart rate is 142. Are you okay? You're like, no, I'm not okay. That's the point, dog. It it was Oh my gosh. They were so good live. It was so amazing to be right up close to them. And then again, my favorite band of all time, they do not tour very much. It is really like if you don't live close to the kind of California Bay area where many of the band members are, it's either there or an occasional festival in Europe that they play at for the most part. So the fact that they played there in Salt Lake City was just kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. And again, so good live, like just, you know, I'm trying to take little snippets of video with my phone and these things would hit and you could, the the picture just goes fuzzy because the sound waves are making the lens vibrate within the phone because it's just yeah. so intense. Uh, it was incredible. It was an amazing show. It was, again, probably my favorite, uh, not probably, my favorite band, probably my favorite show. And I'm still bummed to this day that I didn't think to tell you about it early enough that you could have joined me. Well, you're a good, you're good. I'm <laughs> sad I missed them, but, you know, it, it happens. It uh, you happens. know, I'm... I, I, I miss God, Godspeed You Black Emperor. It happens. I didn't I was not able to make it to a Clockwork Angels tour because the closest was Chicago and I was like I couldn't quite 
a hack like because of when it was in regards to like the school schedule like i couldn't handle going out there and i was like that's okay i'll get them next time (laughs) so that was me in the r40 tour the it was the rush 40th anniversary was the one where i was like i've seen him a bunch i can't couldn't quite make it work with my work schedule and stuff and i was like oh they'll be back around yeah but well, the, I, the one I'll the one I'll shout out to as my final one, just as like a thanks for the cool concert, was I got to see Isis live ooh. when they were touring for their very last album, ooh. and it was their third to last performance yeah. in Salt Lake City, and that was also one of those shows that was just like so loud oh, and yeah. so cool and just like you know I. I, I sometimes think about that band and I'm like, I'm glad you guys got out when y'all wanted to get out, but God, I wish you were still around cause they ruled. They did. They did. But also uh, I understand so le- getting out when you're like, Oh no, there's this other thing called ISIS <laughs> that's around now. We're going to go away now. Goodbye. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, I think that live music is incredible. It, uh, I mean, I love listening to music. Anybody who listens to the pod should know that we love listening to music. But in not every situation, sadly, sometimes you end up disappointed when you go to the live music. But most of the time, the live music enhances. I mean, it really, it, it can, you know, I see a band live for example, I always liked Yob, and then I saw Yob live, and I love Yob. Uh, it enhances, I think, the experience in in a lot of different ways. And uh, there is, you know, I always sort of joke, especially the kind of concerts that I go to, people are always like, oh my gosh, isn't it dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And, and again, maybe this is a little mus- metal elitist of me, and you're welcome to call me on it if you think so. But I always tell folks, you know, here's the thing. When you go to an actual real metal show, the mosh pits are very safe. It's when you go to kind of poser metal shows, I'm thinking five finger death punch or disturbed and, you know, crap like that, where the mosh pits are dangerous because you got a lot of generally middle-aged white dudes with beards and um, who, who just, they're going there to prove something. They're going there to prove how badass they are. And they suck and they're losers. But like at real metal shows, there's like this sense of community, even in the mosh pit, the number of times I have seen someone go down in a pit and the pit immediately stops and multiple people grab the person who went down and lift them up and get them to the edge of the pit. And they're like, are you okay? And only when that person's like, yep, I'm okay, does the pit start again? Or the number of times I've seen somebody hold up a pair of glasses or a phone to try and find the owner and people stop the mosh pit until they get it back to the owner. At that Lamb of God show, there was one of those jackass dudes who wanted to go in the pit and prove he was tough. And he kept throwing punches and they'd push him to the edge. And after the third time he'd been escorted out and security's there because they know something's going on, but security can only do so much. This big dude looks at him and goes, that's not what we do in the pit. And then lays him out. And security just looks at the dude and goes, thanks, we're not allowed to. And then they drag that loser off. So there's like this, I don't know, a sense of community, the experiencing it there with other people that just elevates the music experience to a point that uh, it really becomes something else. And it's one of those things that, Uh, Sometimes it's a real pain in the butt to get to a show, but if it's a show that I really want to see, I'd never regret having made the effort to go there. Sometimes the effort is just not realistic, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but when it's all said and done, it's like, yeah, that was worth it. So those are my thoughts on live music. Anything you want to say before we wrap it up? No, just that I have gotten lazy and I don't go to nearly enough concerts these days. And my wife is like, we should go to more concerts. And (laughs) the answer is we should. The biggest problem is I think that our taste in music is divergent enough that like neither of us really want to see who the other person wants to see. But that is what it is. (laughs) Well, as as, you know, uh, my wife has never gone to any of these shows with me. So it's always something else. But uh all right, well, let's wrap it up there, and uh, we'll talk again and what in a do you couple know? weeks. It wasn't a fast one. It wasn't it a short was one. It was not. All right, till next time, everybody. Have a good one. Let's talk to you all later. Bye. Bye.